Peterson. Well, might I revise that and say the very great Paul Peterson, actor, singing sensation, author, novelist, and activist. This is a joy to be chatting with you. Wow. Thank you, Craig. Hey, it's a pleasure to be here. I got to say, it is a heck of a career and it continues. Let's hop back into the time machine, Paul, uh, because oh, okay. you were one of the original Mouseketeers on the Mickey Mouse Club, and that was 1955. So how old were you then? I was nine. I was still short of my 10th birthday. Yes. And I have the a distinct honor of being the world's first ex musketeer. I was the first kid they fired. That's right. It was a short stint, wasn't it, when you think about it? <laughs> I'll say a blissfully short, in my, for, at least from my perspective. So what uh, happened, it, Paul? Well, I was a nine-year-old boy. Yes. And a handful. I was a disciplinary challenge. Even my third grade teacher, Miss Carnes, said that my behavior was abominable. <laughs> and um, she was right. Um, I wanted to play ball. I wanted to play catch. I'd like to have a wrestle with my fellow uh, thespians. Yes. But the boys were not my kind of boys. And the girls, um, too many of them would rather talk to mirrors than another person. I understand it, Paul, that your mum, Wilma, uh, found that you too were quite a wild child. And is this right? She'd have you chomp down on raw liver if you got a little too out of hand. <laughs> yes, but what she didn't realize is I ended up liking liver and I do to this day, to this day. My wife will tell you, you know, if I go into a restaurant and they have liver on the menu, I'm apt to uh, order it. My mom, she didn't have deep insights, but sometimes she came up with things that struck me to the quick. Uh, on one show, a Montel Williams talk show, uh, he was reciting my early difficulties uh, with, with show business, mm -hmm. despite the fact I was getting work. And my mom said, Montel, Paul could sing, he could dance. He got more than a fair share of the interviews he went on. And she said, what was I supposed to do with him? Well, she there had you off to tap lessons and drama lessons from a very young age, didn't she? Realizing you had this enormous potential to go on and find a great life in showbiz. Well, me and my older sister, Pam, yes, we were uh, standouts. You know, we won every local contest. We were singing at the Hollywood Bowl. Well, I was seven the first time we appeared there. Uh, yes, I get it. You know, I used to chuckle with Gary Coleman who told his, his parents, his adoptive parents, he wanted to be a star. Now, he was four years old. Yeah. But Gary knew that life would be short for him because of the trouble with his kidneys. Yes. And his parents, what were they supposed to do? They took him to an interview, and the next thing you know, he's got a national commercial. He's a hit. NBC looks at him. They build a show around him. And there comes different strokes. Gary Coleman was quite an amazing person, an immeasurably short life, such a sadly yes. short life. And I know that Todd Bridges, in his heart of hearts, really feels that something happened to Gary Coleman, you yes, know, I, along I, the lines of murder. I don't, I don't go so far as that. Uh, sometimes uh, early fame is, uh, is its own tragedy. It's a built-in tragedy. I, you know, I had the, I had the good fortune of sharing a birthday with Mickey Rooney, who unbeknownst to me, uh, was following my career, especially after the Donna Reed show and, and had heard of the troubles that had started to befall me. And unannounced, Mickey Rooney came to my house in Encino, this is before I lost it, and just barged in my front door and sat me down in my own living room and said the following, Paul, you've got to get out of town and get your education because they're not going to let you work for another 25 years. I said, Mick, why, why are you telling me this? Because he said, it happened to me. Wow. That is exactly the truth. And I commend for everyone, look on YouTube, to watch his acceptance speech when he got the Emmy for Bill. 
mm -hmm. because he held that Emmy like a, like a pointer and said, when I was 19 and 20, I was the biggest star in the world. And when I was 40, you wouldn't give me a job. It's interesting you talk about Mickey Rooney because you got to work with his son, Tim Rooney, didn't you? Yes, uh, I did. On the Mickey Mouse Club. And I was friends with Mick Jr. as well. And Mickey Jr. Uh, was kind of sad. He became a recluse. He was very talented and a handsome young man, but he was star-crossed as well. He couldn't get out from under being Mickey Rooney Jr., but we stayed close to him, and along with uh, Peter Ford, Glenn Ford's son, yes. we did our best for him, and we did it all we could, and and uh, we have him properly buried. Now, somebody, Paul, who I know you had, well, makes perfect sense. Uh, you have blood in those veins, after all, the wonderful, the late, great Annette Funicello, who yes. you first met, of course, back then, who didn't have a crush on Annette Funicello. I mean, just what a gorgeous heart and an amazing talent. What was she like to work with, even though you were just a young boy? Well, I, it, it, more than just being a young boy, and of course she was America's sweetheart, mm. she was best friends with Shelley Fabre. These two young Catholic girls, famous in Hollywood, were very close. Yes. So I knew Annette as my sister's best friend so I was just a pesky little brother, believe me, <laughs> but, but very close. And I certainly understood uh, and supported her, her ongoing welfare, welfare because she worked very hard to have some kind of normalcy. And she had a, a wonderful family and close friendships. And uh, she did really very well and even though there was a divorce her children re remained close she eventually met a man glenn who mm. took wonderful care of her and remember she had a 26 year 26 year decline with the ms oh terrible a, a friend of mine uh, neil hitchens who wrote for one of the tabloids uh, neil called me one day to say, Paul, we have the goods on Annette that she's a drunk. And I said, whoa, Neil, you got this all wrong. Got this all wrong. Don't you dare publish something like that. She's knocking over displays, displays at the Gelson market. I said, I know. Here's the problem. She has a severe illness. And it's up to her to disclose it. Not me and not you. Certainly not you. In, in the Inquirer, and uh, Neil, bless his heart, did in fact contact Annette, and she confessed to him that she had MS. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, why don't you talk about it? She said, because people won't love me anymore. And you, that's how, how poisonous celebrity can be. Mm -hmm. I had this same conversation with Dick Clark, who didn't want to disclose that he had a a lethal illness, Dick, people love you. I, you know, you can be impaired. Look, I live this, you know, I, I wish I could be fit and, and, and 16 years old and running around and racing cars. I'll be 78 in two months. I've had major health issues. That's the way it is. I'm still on the right side of the dirt. So things are fine. You certainly are. Darlene Gillespie, though, speaking of yes. somebody who's no longer on that right side of the dirt, another yeah. uh, original Mouseketeer, who again, yes. Paul, I mean, what a woman of incredible sunshine. And then in later years, a very turbulent and very sad life. Yes, indeed. And married poorly mm. with a man who... Uh, thought it was okay to steal someone else's valor. He yes. was not a Medal of Honor winner. Yes. And and Darlene wanted to get back at at a pass that did not allow the country to see how really talented and attractive she was because Annette outshone everybody. Everybody. Well that's the way life is sometimes.
in your fabulously candid memoir, Walt, Mickey and Me, you wrote very candidly about having been fired from the Mickey Mouse Club show, as you referenced, but it was because you'd gotten into an argy-bargy with a casting director who was really... Yes bugging you something fierce, wasn't he? Yes, Lee Travers. He was a wildly overweight man who was always, you know, hail fellow well met and pounding you on the back. But he called me by a nickname I loathe to this day. Yes. He continued to call me Mouse. And I hate that nickname because I was very small and sensitive about being small. I had not yet caught my growth. And on a Friday afternoon, he walked up behind me and tapped me on the shoulder and said, hey, Mouse, how are you doing? And I whirled around and punched him in his big fat stomach and said, don't call me that so." Well, behind Lee Travers stood Walt Disney. That was my last day on the Mouseketeers. And it was out the door for you, Paul Peterson. Speaking of nicknames, though, so there was one you didn't like, Mouse, understandably, um, considering you were sensitive about your size. But you were actually born William Paul Peterson that led to uh, a rather astonishing and I've no doubt very irritating nickname at school. Well, it did because William Paul Peterson very quickly, first grade time, Mm -hmm. becomes Willie Peepee. No, he won't. (laughs) <laughs> Will he be, be? No, he won't. Besides that, I had a a not fun grandfather by the name of William, William Peterson. So I didn't like the name William. And as fate would have it, there was another William Peterson, the Screen Actors Guild, when I was forced to join. So I kept Paul Peterson. That's what everybody called me, Paul Peterson. In fact, the only nickname I've ever been comfortable with is what my friend Brian Byers called me, calls me P squared. That's all <laughs> P squared. So I returned the favor and call him B squared. <laughs> my wife, God bless her, you who, who I will never contradict, calls me Willem. <laughs> and might I say you are a very wise man, Paul Go Peter. Out there. It took Um, me three marriages to learn that. (laughs) (laughs) I know, but third time's the charm, they say. Now, here's the thing, too. Despite that um, situation with Walt Disney and what went down there uh, with the uh, original Mickey Mouse Club, you did wind up working with Walt Disney again because you did this wonderful movie called The Happiest Millionaire, and that was in 1967. And what a cast. Fred McMurray, Greer Garson, Geraldine Page, just to name a few. What was yes. that like? After the Donna Reed show, I was wondering, you know, when is my next starring role coming? Yes. And I got a call to do a movie with Walt Disney called Happiest Millionaire. Yes. To be partnered with my buddy and longtime friend, still friends, Eddie Hodges, the boy who sang, uh, I'm going to knock and ring and tap until you do. Anyway, uh, it was wonderful. It was choreographed dancing. It was singing. It was on the lot where I had first uh, gone to work. Of course, the story behind it, Craig, you'll like this. Uh, my car broke down the night before I was supposed to go to, to work. Mm-hmm. So I took my motorcycle to, to Disney. And at the front gate, they wouldn't let me in because motorcycles were not allowed on the 44 acre lot of Walt Disney, uh, Disney Studios. And they had to call upstairs to Walt's office to get permission to let me come to work. And when I saw Mr. Disney later that day, he said, oh, Peterson, you're always causing trouble. (laughs) (laughs) I was frankly honored to be there because that was the last movie that Walt would do. Yes. He sadly passed away in December of that year. Uh, he didn't really have time or energy to put his final touches, his embellishments, the Disney touch on that movie. Mm. Nonetheless, I, unless I was proud to be there. I, and, I'm truly proud. And proud you were too, I understand it, in 1958 to star in a beautiful movie. I've got to say, it's one of my favorites. Houseboat with Cary Grant, you played his son, Sophia yes. Loren. How would you describe, Paul, 
the, the remarkable Cary Grant that you got to know? Well, I did. First of all, I called him Mr. G till the end of his life. Um, it was the best motion picture experience I ever had. I did a lot of movies, but working with a, a star of that magnitude and was Sophia Loren, oh my goodness. I mean, I was 12 years old and knew what I was looking at. <laughs> you know? Harry Grant was the most generous adult performer besides Don Reed that I'd ever worked with. He was remarkably tuned in to your needs as a performer. He loved being a straight man. Mm -hmm. He tossed you the dialogue so that you would look your best. For a young performer, he took the time to explain the contextual meaning of the scene that we were about to film. He wanted me to be secure and, and understand that behind the dialogue, there was a purpose. There was a reason. And uh, that stood me in, in good stead as a performer and lasted, frankly, well, for as long as I performed. But the, the friendship that developed out of that uh, was, at least to my mind, a remarkable and, and a cherished memory. Mm. You know, it's very difficult to impress old line movie stars because they've done the work, they've been there. Uh, Henry Fonda was another person I got to work with. And uh, it so happened that an event took place when Don Pedersen came down and wanted me to tone down my character as a ex-con going out with his daughter. And he thought there'd be trouble asking me to reduce my the, the intensity of the performance. And I just looked at Mr. Federson. I said, well, of course, I'm happy to turn it down. I'm here for you. I'm not here for me. You want less? I'll give you less. And when the scene was subsequently reshot and everybody was happy, Henry Fonda himself came over to me. And mind you, I was quite junior to him. He said, Paul, I want you to know that's one of the most professional things I've ever witnessed. That is not faint praise. That came from Henry Fonda. Oh, of course. I mean, just to think about your good fortune to be working with Mr. G, as yes. you referred to him, that must have been, Paul, like a master class. You know, when well, you just think of being in such exquisite and and uh, and almost peerless company that must have just been quite something to watch him go through uh you know his motions every day right and and i was believe me appreciative because he never missed a beat hmm. he was in touch with everyone cast and crew alike i remember we were doing one very complicated and difficult scene and a crewman up on the rafters was way up there trying to stifle a cough. And then in the middle of a complicated uh, scene, Cary Grant suddenly said, just a moment, let's let the poor bugger cough. Mm. Just, you know, and that was, that was Cary Grant. It was like, look, this was a big budget picture. This was the highest level of, of Hollywood. This was the golden age. So I, I, it really was a high watermark. When it comes to movies, that's one I really enjoyed. And, and the testament to Paul, I think, is the fact that you two remain great friends right up till the end. I mean, you were playing yes. his son in a movie. You know, I mean, you go on to other projects, people lose touch. That's the natural attrition of life in show business. Yes. But you two remain firm friends right to the end, which I think from memory came from him in about 1986. He was in Iowa about to do his one man show and suffered a devastating stroke. Yes, well, especially in Iowa, which was the ancestral home of Donna Reed. Mm. Uh, Donna uh, Reed and Cary Grant were, were close friends. And it was in fact, Cary Grant's recommendation that gave Donna the confidence to hire me and it was her decision. 
as Jeff Stone in her in her series. And interestingly, Don Reed, for anybody who's a student of films and you watch her work, her Academy Award winning work, mm. she didn't so much as play a part. She reacted to everyone around her. If you watch her face, and whether it's a wonderful life or from here to eternity, something is going on mm. all the time. She listened. The Donna Reed show came straight after Houseboat, as you say. I think you appeared in all 275 episodes, if I'm correct, of the Donna Reed show. Correct. Yes, uh, everyone from 1958 through the end, uh, which was broadcast in 1966, there I was yes. on stage one. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, it, it was a, a remarkable show, still loved. Who can forget that opening with the telephone ringing and down the yes. stairs she swirls? Um, what was the show like to work on? Did you really feel as though Donna was kind of like your mum? Of course, I called her mum, believe me, on the set. Mm -hmm. Unless there were other people around, and by that I mean visitors yes. or you know executives from upstairs, uh, I called her mom. I did in front of other people. I called her Miss Reed, and always did. In fact, she had to tell me in my mid twenties, Paul, you have to start calling me Donna. To work with her and Carl Betts and yes. Shelley Fabre, yes. not to mention the endless procession of people who came as guest stars uh, was a fantastic experience. And being the kind of person I am, um, I didn't have a guardian because who would be a better guardian than Donna Reed? Every adult male on the set had the right to discipline, discipline me if I stepped out of line. And there were a lot of guys around who didn't take any crap from me. They did not. But we all enjoyed each other because we were professionals. So tell me, Paul, about the Donna Reed that you got to know. What was she like? Donna Reed was the oldest of five children from a hard scrabble farm in Iowa. And so there was this center core of being an Iowa farm girl overlaid with an MGM trained Hollywood actress which she did on her own. When I first saw her in person, my grandfather, Grandpa Burr, insisted on taking me to the studio the first day. And he walked right up to her and he said, Donna Bell Mullinger, I know your dad. And she was so gracious. It didn't faze her, didn't bother her. Of course, Grandpa Burr knew her dad. Uh, they were both from Western Iowa, and it was a distinct honor after her death in 1986, along with Cary Grant, to uh, help start the Donna Reed Foundation in her hometown, which, by the way, is the place where she left her Oscar in the most prominent family's home in Denison, Iowa. She was, in fact, the local gal who did good. <laughs> Her death, though, too, very sad. She succumbed to the odious pancreatic cancer. You know, pancreatic cancer is lethal, mm -hmm. even to this day. We uh, thought that her stomach ailments were uh, like an ulcer. Mm -hmm. And in fact, she went in in December 1985 to, to have exploratory surgery to see if something could be corrected. And they closed her up in 20 minutes and the doctor came out and said to her widower Grover, she has pancreatic cancer and the tumor is as large as a carrot. And Grover said, well, what do we do? What, what do you, what's called for? And the doctor said, Grover, Donna will be dead inside of 30 days. So it was brutal. Although she used that last 30 days to make sure Shelley's birthday present was delivered, that her children were well cared for, that her estate was in order. She's a remarkable woman. You you got to work with, as you say, some incredible people uh, during yeah. those years on the Donna Reed show. But Bob Crane, who played Dr. Dave um, Kelsey on that show, 
for whatever yeah. reason, right away, you didn't like him at all, did oh, you? Didn't like him at all. Don't like him to this day. Let me remind everyone, after Hogan's Heroes and, and the industry thinking he was so some big deal, he was murdered. And the sheriff in Arizona, after looking into this man's sordid life, said the following, this is one murder I hope not to solve. He, uh, Bob Crane died in a manner that befitted his tawdry life. Mm. I didn't like him at all. He was always sitting on my girlfriend. It's unbelievable. Like, just Bob, knock it off. Don't be chasing after my skirts. Terrible man. I had uh, other people throughout the industry who worked with Bob, who actually, frankly, knew him back in the radio days when he worked mm. the morning show. Because he was a great uh, disc jockey, wasn't he? I mean, back in oh, his day, he was a brilliant disc jockey. Yeah, and he was. With He should have never got in front of the camera mm. because it provided him with rich hunting grounds. Yes. That's yes. what he really cared about. Well, Paul, how lucky have you been throughout your incredible showbiz career? You sometimes must pinch yourself working with all these greats, but your TV sister... The fabulous <laughs> Nelly Fabres, I know is somebody very dear to your heart, very special. You two really did get on like brother and sister, didn't you? Well, we did. We scrapped all the time, but boy, don't ever come between us. You know, yeah. this is Lord help the mister who comes between me and my sister. Uh, Shelly, uh, she was a great sister. She is a great sister. Yeah, she and yeah. Jimmy Hawkins came down on my 77th birthday to share a pizza with me because it's hard for me to get out these days. And it was such a joy to see her. And I have stories about Shelley that that the brothers will understand this. She was a great gal, a fun. And I remember she got so angry at me one day because I I wasn't properly appreciative. Of, of Elvis Presley's talent. And she invited, insisted on inviting me to the studio where he was doing the movie with her. And she parked me over on the side while he got ready to do this, this act. And I got to meet him, you know, we met at the barber shop. We both went to JC bring him up, you know, so I knew Elvis, I talked with him. But then the music started. And suddenly, there was Elvis Presley, for God's sake, gigantic star. I've only, I've only seen that in three or four people where whatever that light bulb is inside that distinguishes the truly gifted performer, he had it in spades. Uh, Betty, Betty Davis had that same light bulb. Um, Johnny Carson, that same light bulb. Uh, you know when you're in the presence of a big star. And Shelley, after the song was over on that soundstage, said, well, what do you got to say now, buddy? <laughs> <laughs> well, because she got to work with him in not one, not two, but three movies. Uh, three, that's correct. And, you know, it's interesting, Paul, because she's one of those people who really doesn't cash in on any of that. She doesn't tell stories of Elvis. She Never. keeps very much tucked away in her memories and in her heart and with great respect, doesn't she? Yes, indeed she does. In fact, uh, we're friends with Jerry, uh, Elvis's uh, longest. Shilling. Uh, yes, uh, he has only the greatest admiration for Shelley because she, like Anne Margaret and like Jerry, mm. uh, kept her secrets and good for her. Shelly always appreciated the work that she was doing. She was very good at it. Let's remember this gal was a gifted comedian and adored by the people who worked with her. And a wonderful, wonderful singer as well. And of course, she's been married for years to another Hollywood great, Mike Farrell, of course, many That's know him correct. from MASH, but I mean, Mike is one of the really great guys. I mean, talk about working with legends too. Let me, I know we're kind of hopping all over the place here, Paul, but you've had such an amazing life. I'll take you back to 1967 and a movie with Glenn Ford that you made, a yes. time 
killing, which as I understand a bit of amazing trivia, that was Harrison Ford's movie debut. That is correct. I actually did two movies with Harrison. Yes. And I'm a big admirer of his body of work because what a charmed career he's had. Uh, I did another one called Journey to Shiloh with him. With James uh, Kahn as well, yeah. Yes, uh, well, there were seven young male stars who, frankly, were pretty good actors. You know, Michael Sarazen, Don yeah. Stroud, Michael Fox, yeah. Harrison, and uh, me, the proverbial uh, ham sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> with hot mustard on the side. Yeah, that, that's me. That's me. No, it was... It was fun to work with Harrison because he took it seriously. I remember when we did Journey to Shiloh, Jimmy Kahn calling us all together because it was a throwaway movie. Universal was just throwing each of us into this movie because they had contracts with all of us and they needed to, you know, it was pay or play. And they wanted us to play. So uh, they put this movie together and Jimmy Kahn said to all of us, let's make this better than they think it is. If we did, it's a damn good little picture. What are your memories of Harrison? Like, did you see a potential greatness? Mm. Uh, no, I never did see it. Uh, he was very quiet and he was observant and he did the work that he was asked to do. Uh, no fuss. Mm -hmm. uh, and I didn't really recognize anything quote unquote special until I saw Star Wars. And it's like, whoa, wait a minute, I worked with that guy. And and that's the way it works sometimes, that magic alchemy when when the perfect part comes to the perfect actor. You know, Spencer Tracy, when he first worked with um with the uh, Sidney Poitier, uh, walked up behind Sidney Poitier, who was kind of lurking behind the camera. And he hadn't met him. So he said, uh, excuse me, we haven't met. What's your name? And Sidney Poitier said, well, it's Sidney Poitier. And Spencer Tracy said to him, well, what do you do around here? And Sidney Poitier said, well, I'm an actor, sir. And Spencer Tracy said, don't let anybody catch you at it. Pretty sound advice. Yeah, that's true. Absolutely. Yes, yes that is, I think, the key to good acting. Don't yeah. let anybody catch you at it. Yeah, that's right. Don't let them see the wheels turning. It just exactly. happens, doesn't it? Now, in the 80s, you had a regular role on TV's Matt Houston with yes. uh, the wonderful Lee Horsley as Matlock Houston. And he's still going, but he kind of, you know, bobbed out of showbiz years ago, didn't he? Are you two well, still in touch? Well, he, he was a fabulous fellow. And my advice to him when, when he left that show was you are making a mistake, Lee. Mm -hmm. Don't do this. Do not do this. Years later, I saw him at an industry party. And uh, my wife will warrant this is a true tale. And he said to me, I should have listened to you. The things I have learned, I learned at great cost sometimes. And I have been fortunate that it, in moments of clarity, I know when a great lesson has been shared with me. Mm -hmm. And uh, Lee Horsley was a lot of fun, but I wouldn't have even been there if it hadn't been for, for Aaron Spelling, who uh, wanted me to continue to work. You know, I really did believe that I was supposed to have a long and active and productive career as a performer. Little did I know God had other plans. Um, I couldn't, I can appreciate people who have long public careers doing something they're recognized as being good at. But nothing in my life can ever match the satisfaction the creation of a minor consideration mm -hmm. has given me. So just to frame this, Paul, as I said yes. at the outset, you know, amongst your um, immeasurable talents and, and, and so forth, you know, singer, actor, uh, novelist, author, but activist. And it was over 30 years ago, maybe 35 years ago, a minor consideration came to being, and it was on the back of the very sad death of Rusty Hamer. Step yes. me through how it came about 
and why it was that Rusty became such a driving force for you to want to make a change? Well, because on that Sunday morning when his death was announced, I recognized in a moment of clarity, out of a deep sleep, mm -hmm. that I should have been there. Mm -hmm. That's why I said to my wife that morning, that'll never happen again. Because I meant it, because there was a tap on my shoulder that said to me, you have to do something about this. Because at that moment, there were other former kid stars in trouble. Mm. And I immediately picked up the phone and called Jay North, who was Dennis the Menace. Mm. And I woke him up and I said, Jay, our friend Rusty Hamer has killed himself. And into the dead silence that followed that declaration, I said to him, Jay, it's going to happen to you if you don't let me help you get some help. Mm -hmm. And for the first time in a long relationship, he said, okay. So he was open. He recognized that it shouldn't have happened to Rusty. Jay also was overweight and all too friendly with guns. He had, mm -hmm. he had a hit list of people who had done dirt to him. Well, the next call I made after I got off the phone with Jay North was to his friend and our, my long standing friend, Jeannie Russell, Dr. Jeannie Russell, who played Margaret on Dennis the Menace. Yes. And I quickly explained to her Rusty's death and Jay's willingness to get help. We had no idea what to do. But as you know, I'm married to a showbiz nurse who knew where ther therapists were. And we all pitched in together. And before you know it, suddenly we were talking to Todd Bridges, to Dana Plato, mm. Danny Bonaducci, to Lisa Loring, people who were in trouble. Mm. And that's how a minor consideration came into being. And I took the book I was writing and I just set it on the side. It was called a minor consideration because the people were way more important than the manuscript. Of course. And for those who don't remember, just back to Rusty Hamer, I mean, I, I recall he was so loved as Danny <laughs> Thomas's son in Make Room for Daddy and so many things. What happened in those intervening years that drove him to the edge? He couldn't sustain that kind of quick-witted humor he was growing up and he didn't of course have the support of some gifted writers let's not forget uh 12 years on on the danny thomas show provided him with rich material and he was really funny oh boy was he funny uh but when the work was over when hollywood was done with him they were done with him plain and simple mm -hmm. and there was no work <laughs> Things began to drift away from him, cars, beautiful women, meaning. And uh, despite the best efforts of his brother, John, uh, Rusty descended into a, a very bitter uh, uh, cesspool. And, and it was quite a shame mm. because, Craig, I should have gone. I could have gone to his house. I was there. I could afford it. I had the time. I certainly had an abiding affection for this man, my age, a, a fellow, co fellow Cobra owner, mm -hmm. uh, a guy who had cut a wide swath in Hollywood that I admired as a performer. And I just didn't do it. Well, that's what happens every day now. If, if someone's in trouble and I hear about it, I'm going to show up. You're on the case. That's right. Well, yeah. You know, and it's embarrassing sometimes because I've had more than a few people uh, to tell me get lost. Mm. Don't need your help. Don't want your help. And when I go to their funerals, I don't bring that up because they're just one of the sausages in a string. And yeah. this string of sausages goes all the way back to the 19 teens. For many years, our oldest member, Craig, was Diana Sarah Carey, who passed away in her late 90s, but she was a, a contemporary of Jackie Coogan. Mm. And similarly, 
made four and a half million dollars before she was 10 years old. And if you ever have a chance, she wrote a series of books, one I recommend highly, uh, called Hollywood's Children. Read it. Another one you might pick up is her uh, biography of um, Jackie Coogan, which not so incidentally, the dedication was to me in a minor consideration. Yes. She got it. Talking to her in her 90s was like talking to a a young boy on a television show who will remain nameless for now, but giving him the same lecture that Mickey Rooney gave me, I gave to this kid. He got it. And I, and you see, Paul, I also take it that you'd had your troubled times as well oh, sure. when things began to evaporate. And that is what made Mickey Rooney suddenly think, I got to get to this guy and just tell him some home truths. And yes. that turned your life around because then you went off and you studied. You've been an author to well over a dozen best-selling books now. And, yes. and then, of course, out of that sprung um, with on the back of uh, Rusty Hamer's tragedy, a minor consideration. But, you know, a minor consideration beyond the personal part of, of touching young celebrities who, who are living adult lives away from their early fame. Yes. You have to there are laws that need changing. Let me give you an example. At the end of every movie you've seen where an animal is employed, there's a little bug at the end from the American Humane Association. Mm -hmm. No animal was killed or injured in the making of this film. Why doesn't it say that for kids? Why doesn't it say that for kids? Well, the reason is children are not protected by the entertainment industry. They have been abused since Shakespeare's time. Mm -hmm. The American Humane Association started life as a child welfare league back in New York in the late 1800s. But you know where the money is? Protecting animals, not children. But nonetheless, we have allies. There are laws that need to be changed. Every kid, everywhere, working in a medium that brings them celebrity and, and money mm. ought to have guaranteed education, guaranteed savings account, and a, a, an action plan mm. for what comes after. Of course. That's, that's the key. That's the plan for the future. I just can't stop thinking, you know, you go back over the over the you know the the decades and decades of of Hollywood and these bright, luminous, amazing young people who are just yeah. they're the heart and soul of so many <laughs> movies. Bobby Driscoll springs to mind. What yes. happened to him? His corpse to be found surrounded by empty bottles and and buried in Potter's Field, a pauper's yes. grave. I mean, these stories are absolute unutterable tragedies, Paul, aren't they? Yes, they are. Uh, but it tells you how how little true concern the industry and even adult uh, uh, post stars have for these these young little puppets. Paul, you hear so much about it, uh, the curse of the child star. Do you think, in many respects, there is a curse? Yeah, of course, it is. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, that curse exists. It exists in the carelessness of the industry. Who's standing up for them? That's what we do in a minor consideration. We need yes. to change those rules. You are an angel, Paul. When I think of your work and I look back over it and I think of the people, and of course, so much of it needs to be anonymous. You don't name people. That's for them to reveal their journeys, isn't it? To Absolutely. reveal how they get on with it. But I mean, you are just an absolute angel and a godsend in this entertainment biz. And yet I also look at your life and, and for all of its triumphs, and you've been very candid about those slow periods and when you've needed to make adjustments, but even looking back to your first wife, who was a remarkable actress, Brenda yes. Bennett, who had achieved so much, then, you know, you've been candid about Bill Bixby coming onto the scene and that created for you a heartbreak, of course. Yes. But then... She wound up taking her own life as well, Paul. That's right. And, and interestingly, despite the rather public uh, humiliation of having your wife leave you for a prominent man like Bill Bixby, yes. Bill yes. Bixby and I repaired every bridge. Mm. And at the end of his life, Bill called 
and said to me, Paul, I have no reason to be able to ask you this, but I hope you take care of Brandon Cruz, who was the little boy oh, yes. in courtship of Eddie's father. Yes. That's how much it meant to him and what it means to me. And Brandon is doing quite well. Thank you very much. Yes. And uh, I'm not an angel, but uh, he he's welcome in my home anytime. Look, I can't let you go. And I've so loved this chat because, you know, you are a most remarkable person. But it was the late, great Ricky Nelson, I think, that kind of in a, in a spooky way inspired you to veer off and have this fabulous music career at Lollipops and Roses. My oh. dad, uh, you know, can't find her keys. Um, That's a fun one. <laughs> oh, I know. You, you recorded so many wonderful songs. And again, you did some fabulous songs with Shelley. Shelly yes. phrase as well. You've had so many interesting parts in your showbiz career. 68 years on from those Mickey Mouse Club days, you must sometimes, Paul, pinch yourself thinking, you know, I didn't do too badly, did I, all said and done? Uh, you know, I, 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 hope, I hope at the pearly gates I get some consideration for that. Uh, you know, when you speak about the music career, I don't know if you know this, but I was the first white singer under contract to Motown. I didn't know that. You're right. I am. Most people don't. And the Motown mucky mucks don't brag about me, but I was there. <laughs> you could have been a Supreme in another life. Can you imagine? <laughs> I was a great admirer of their music and had the fun of actually working with Mary and the rest of the gals. And it was fun to walk into into the Motown studios, whereas Barry Gordy said to me, the funk just drips off the wall. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Paul Peterson, it is so lovely to chat with you and to catch up on so many incredible stories. But, but moreover, the incredible work that you do for a minor consideration that all began on the back of a tragedy, and that was Rusty Hamer. And to this day, 2023 continues, and there are so many young people and those who've been through the system chewed up by it that still need the great support of fabulously big-hearted people like you. Wow, thank you, Craig. That means a lot to me because the fact is we're all in this together. We can do better for the kids that come to our attention. Uh, I root for them, uh, not only in the midst of their celebrity, but for the next adventure. Mm -hmm. when, when your career comes to a halt and you're not yet 25 years old and you're thrown on this scrap heap, you better have a plan to address the next adventure. And that's what a minor consideration is all about, the next adventure. Thank you, Paul, for everything you've done, for the, ah. the joy you've brought to millions over very many decades, uh, but for what you continue to do. Well, thank you, Craig. It's been my pleasure to speak with you.